Welcome back to the channel here. My name is TJ Erickson. I am a teacher and fishing guide based out of Park Rapids, Minnesota. Before I was in Park Rapids, I was born and raised up in Roseau, Minnesota. So I cut my teeth up on Lake of the Woods and the Rainy River. Cut my teeth? Is that how the saying goes? I don't know. Cut my teeth, brush my teeth, whatever it is. I grew up fishing Lake of the Woods, fishing the Rainy River. It is kind of my home waters and I absolutely love to get back there whenever I can. And we're approaching the time when it gets to be the spring run on the Rainy River. It is truly a special time and truly a special place when those big walleyes get up into the river. And I get a lot of questions on the Rainy River and just a lot of questions about the timing and all of that. So today I'm going to answer a lot of the questions that I get. Things like, where are some of the best boat ramps? What is the best time to go? I'm going to talk about different locations that I try, different setups, what my rod reel setup is, and what kind of baits that I use. I'm going to answer all those questions and more in today's video, so make sure we stick around. We've got a lot of information that we're going to cover, and we're going to start with the question that I get the most, and that has to do with boat ramps. There seems to be some confusion on maybe where some of these ramps are, what their names are, and kind of where they are located along the river. So I'm going to talk through each of the main public landings that are on the Rainy River from Four Mile Bay all the way down to about Pelin. So I'm going to pull up a graphic here, and I'm going to talk through the main public landings that are on the Rainy River, starting with up at Four Mile Bay. Starting up kind of by Four Mile Bay is Wheeler's Point. It is a big access that has multiple lanes and it's very easy to get people in and out of there quickly. This is the access that is closest to the mouth of the Rainy River, but it's also the one that opens up the latest. As we move south and east, we get to Timbermill Park, which is just on the east side of the Bidette. There is one on the Bidette River as well, but that one doesn't usually open up in time for the Rainy River on Timbermill is the one that has easy access and opens up much quicker. As we move further east, we have Vitus Landing, which is right by Clemenson, and that one is right around mile marker 138. I'm gonna add some mile markers on these ones as we move east, so it's a little bit easier to identify where they are added. And I should note, I got these mile markers from the Royal Dutchman Facebook page. If you're looking for some very up-to-date information, they always let you know when the river's opening up and where the open water is, so make sure you go and follow their Facebook page for some of those updates. So you have Vitus Landing at about mile marker 138. Moving a little further east, you have Frontier, which is at about mile marker 148. Then you get Birchdale and Franz Jevney, which are at 156 and 157. They're very close together. And as we move further east, the next major landing is Coots Landing over by Pelin, and that is at mile marker 187. So those are some of the major public landings that get used during the Rainy River run. Um, there are some other landings, but a lot of those are on resorts or different private landings. Um, but those are the main ones that you're gonna hear about and the main ones that you're gonna wanna use. The next question that I get a ton is, when is the best time to go? And my answer to that is whenever you can go. Whenever it's open and you can go, get up there and try it, because you never know when it's going to turn on. Now there are some typical patterns that I see from year to year that tend to give pretty good indicators of when the bite is going to heat up, but anytime you can get up there, I suggest getting up there and giving it a shot. And not only that, but some of these patterns and timing change drastically from year to year. So there's typically a sweet spot of when to go up there. It's when the water is warming up enough to where those walleyes are moving up into the river farther, but also early enough where the forks don't break loose and muddy the river. You know, sometimes that bite is a couple weeks long, sometimes it's only a few days or even a day long. But as that water warms, if you can get that right before before those forks break loose, when those walleyes are getting up into the river, that is typically what I have found to be that sweet spot of where you can really get going and you can really boat a lot of big fish. And obviously water clarity is huge. Once those forks break loose and it muddies up the river, it can be very tough to get bite. So if you can get good water clarity, that's also going to improve that bite. And going off of that, now we're gonna talk a little bit about water temps. Now, I'm definitely not a biologist, so I'm not gonna have all the science behind it, and I'm just a fisherman, but here are some of my observations that I've seen. Water temps play a huge factor in the Rainy River Run. You know, it's not the only factor but it's one of the easiest to measure and so it's easy to relay and so we can get some pretty good patterns down as far as when these fish are moving up according to some of the water temperature. You know those walleyes are staging in the lake until you get a lot of the right conditions. Both the water temperature and the current and even some of the photo periods play a big impact into that. So once those fish are ready they move on up in and it can be a lot of fun. So in my experience what I kind of see is once those water temps get into about the mid 30s range that's when you start to see the first push of the walleyes moving up the river. Once that continues to warm into the high 30s and the low 40s, then you really start seeing an even bigger push of walleyes moving up into the river. You know, there's other factors that contribute to that as well. Both the photo periods and the current can play an impact, but it seems like once that water temperature goes up to about those low 40s, that is when I find to be the best bite that I get throughout the spring. And that bite seems to continue to get better until about the forks break loose. Every once in a while, when you get an early thaw and that river opens up early, those forks break loose early, and then you can have a really good bite once that water temperature clears up. So again, it's variable from year to year, but in general, once it get into that high 30s, low 40s before the forks break loose, that is going to be your prime time bite. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit of etiquette and just some other tips that you can use to make your experience up at the Rainy River better for everyone. And first and foremost, please just be kind and patient. I know everyone's excited to get out. I know there's a line, so that increases the stress, 
but do your best to be kind, be patient, help each other out when we're up there. Everyone's up there just to catch fish and have a good time. So please be kind and be patient. I've been up there when I've seen older guys that are trying to get their boats in and they're struggling and there's other people yelling at them, telling them to hurry up. So please just be good people and enjoy your time up there, but be kind. Going right off of that, also please do your best to have your stuff ready before you put it into the water. Get your gear ready, get your plug in, get all of that ready before it's your turn to back in. A lot of times there is a line, so you have time to get some of that stuff ready. If you can have multiple people in the boat, it helps a lot to just speed up that process. When there's cooler temps, it's helpful to bring either gravel or salt to help with some of that traction or even a tow strap. There's one year we were up there and the ramp got so slippery that we actually had to help each other back down with a tow strap in order to not slip and get out of control. So now going off of that, one of the things that is very important is as you're pulling your boat out, either the trailer or the boat, when you're pulling that out, stop once you get out of the water and let that water drain right by the base there. The reason we do this is because when if you pull out right away and all that water goes up to the very top of the ramp, it can freeze up high. And when that water freezes and the ramp gets slippery up high, then it can be very dangerous for yourself, for your boat, and for other anglers around there as well. So even though everybody's in a big hurry trying to get out, take those extra 30 seconds to stop, let that boat drain a little bit, because if you get some ice buildup closer to the water, it's not nearly as big of a deal as if it's 20, 30 feet up the ramp. Another word of caution is if you have a bunk trailer, be very careful. I would leave it hooked up until you get it into the water. You know, a lot of guys with bunk trailers, they can unhook it and they will be just fine 90% of the time. But I have seen where those bunks get slippery because there's either some moisture and it freezes or other variables when it gets cold like that and they start to back down and their boat gets dumped on the concrete there. So for the safety of your boat and not only that, but just for the ease of everybody else using that access, make sure that you keep it locked up until you get into the water. It might add a few more seconds and be a little less convenient, but it will definitely save you a bad day if you dump that boat on the concrete. And one more thing, as you pull your boat out of the water, make sure that you lower your motor so that way that water can drain, not only for AIS purposes, but also so that way you don't have any water freezing and breaking anything inside your motor or lower unit. Once you get on the water, again, be courteous. There's a lot of anglers out there and it can get very, very packed very easily. So when you're navigating the river, when you're going up on plane, just be very careful as you're moving in and around boats so that way everybody stays safe. And on top of that as well, please wear your life jacket. It's something that I am really working on improving and it's easy to forget about when you have it on your seat and you're going from spot to spot. But in those cold temperatures, when there's so many boaters, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. And if you get thrown from your boat in those cold water temperatures, it can be very dangerous. So please wear your life jacket. Another thing that's super important is to please protect these fish. You know, I'm still a little bit conflicted at times about this rainy river run. You know, the cold water up there helps a lot. And I've seen very few fish being killed on the river because of those cold temperatures. But if you think about it, these fish are making this long run up the river to spawn and it's very taxing on them. So these fish are tired, they're swimming a long way, and they not only that, but they also just got done fighting a fight of their life to get up to the top. So when you net these fish, I highly recommend, please just keep that net in the water with the fish in the water. I know I'm just like anybody that wants to hide the fish that we catch, keep on your secret spot, but in all reality, there's not a whole lot of secret spots on the Rainy River, so please protect these fish and hold that net in the water until you can get the hook out, pull it out, take a quick picture, and then get it back in the water as quickly as you can. You know, as electronics improve and as fishing pressure increases, us as anglers need to be very good stewards of the resources that we have and protect these fish. Now I'm going to move into a little bit of some fish catching stuff, talking about locations and some other tips and tricks for the spring river run. You know, some of the locations that I find a lot of walleyes during this time of year are based around some of those deeper holes. You know, depending on the part of the river you're in, that might be 25 five feet, that might be 15 feet. So finding some of that deeper water and fishing the edges of that tend to hold a lot of fish. And sometimes when the walleyes are coming up in full force, you can even fish in the middle of those holes or in the middle of the river, and there's gonna be fish kind of scattered throughout that. You know, there's gonna be big groups of boats and you can see people catching fish on the edges and also right in the middle of those. You know, as we get a little more specific, finding some of those current breaks can be huge. Whether it's the inside of a turn where that current's coming along the outside, and then there's a little bit of a current break on the inside of that turn, that can be a very good pattern. Anytime there's some steeper breaks, fishing the edges of those can sometimes be enough of a current break where those fish will hang out right on the edge of that. Finding different islands, you know, there's not a lot of islands on the river, but every once in a while you can get behind one of those and that will be a good current break. Or a lot of times what you'll find is some different rocks or some different humps, just different little pieces of structure 
that can be just enough of a difference in that current for those fish to hang behind. Another thing that a lot of people are picking up on in recent years is kind of finding that washboard and bottom where you see those bumps as you're moving along with your 2D sonar. A lot of times those fish will hide right behind those as the current flows over top and those even if they're right in the middle can hold a lot of fish. Another pattern that can be very effective but is a little bit different is fishing some of those shallower flats especially again on those inside of those turns. If you be casting you know ripping wraps or different kind of rattle baits or even jigs and plastic jigs and minnows those can be very effective to find especially some of those bigger fish. The other thing that I'll try is if none of those are really producing every once in a while I will try to find the strongest current that I can. You'll find some of those current seams and not as often as some of the other places, but every once in a while we'll see pretty good groups of fish on some of those high current areas. So those are some of the main areas that I target when I'm looking for walleyes on the river in the springtime. You know, when we're talking about sturgeon, I'm not talking a lot about sturgeon in this video, but for sturgeon, finding those deep holes is obviously key as well. Fishing the front end and the back end of those holes, you'll typically find a lot of fish. Another thing that I found recently to be very effective too, is if there's two holes, fishing that high spot right in between those. That seems to be a high traffic area where they're going from one to the other and you'll get a lot of fish moving through there. You know when you're fishing for sturgeon using a flat two to five ounce weight along with a circle hook or a lot of times they make these sturgeon rigs and just globbing a bunch of worms on that. There's not a lot better than that. It's a simple rig but it's super effective. Now moving on to some of the setup that I use when I'm fishing the river and I'm first going to talk about rods. When I fish the river I use a little bit heavier rod. Um, a lot of times for walleyes I'll use a medium light but on the river I will use a medium and that is because we're going to be using a little bit heavier jigs. You know anywhere from that three eighths even out to three quarter ounce jigs seem to be best. When I'm fishing vertical and I'm just slow moving up the river, I will use a little bit shorter rod. I will use a six foot medium and that is one of my favorite rods for the Rainy River. And this one is the Rosemore Outdoor Gear and it is actually called the Manitou Rapids and it is named after the Manitou Rapids on Rainy River. It is an awesome vertical jig rod. You know, a lot of people are using a little bit longer rods nowadays, but this six foot rod is awesome for going right underneath the boat and for doing vertical jigging. And that medium action just helps you work some of those bigger baits a little bit easier. So for my vertical presentations, I am using a six foot medium. When I am casting or pitching either rattle baits or jigs, then I go up a little bit and I go to a seven foot. Now this is a seven foot medium and this one is called the Chambers Island. And this is again from Rosemore Outdoor Gear. These are awesome rods, they're super lightweight and they are perfect for this rainy river run. You know, I like to run this seven foot when I'm pitching jigs because it gives me a little more whip action. I can get that bait out there a little bit farther and gives me a little bit more length when I'm setting the hook from a little bit farther away. And for reels, all of my reels that I'm using on my summer rod are the PC Fun Carbon X 2000. They are just phenomenal reels, super lightweight. They have an awesome smooth drag and especially when you're fishing some of these bigger fish that like to go on these runs having that PC Fun Carbon X paired with the Rosemore Outdoor Gear rod is just a deadly combination because the rod has enough of that give to take some of those big head shakes and the reel has a smooth enough drag where if they want to take a run they can take a run and still stay pinned. On those reels I'm running an 8 to 10 pound braid with usually about a 10 pound fluoro leader and I like to go with a little bit smaller braid even though we're targeting some of those bigger fish that smaller braid seems to cut through the current a little bit better and allows you to keep that bait a little more vertical and a little bit closer to the boat so you can feel those bites a little bit better. Now as far as baits go, don't be afraid to go big. One of my favorite jigs that I use on the river is this jig right here. And I don't even know the name of this one for sure, but it's got a little bit of a blade to add a little bit more action. It's a nice heavy jig and it's got a nice shape to it. So it cuts through that current fairly well. And having that bigger profile down there definitely seems to attract more bites. And I'll try to find a little bit bigger minnow, either rainbows or some bigger shiners to use on that. But some of those frozen shiners that are smaller or even some fat heads work perfectly fine on those as well. Another one of the staples for the river is the jig and plastic. You know, there's a lot of different variations that you can do between colors. Um, and different types of plastics. I like to use a paddle tail if the current is slow enough because it gives that nice good action. If it's a little bit faster, I'll use more of that moxie style plastic that cuts through that current a little bit more and stays a little bit closer to bottom. Another one that I like to use as I'm pitching on some of those shallower flats is either a blade bait or a rattle bait, something that's gonna make a lot of noise, that's gonna be a little bit slower moving and that's gonna give a lot of action for those fish to sense. Another one that can be very effective up there is a type of three-way rig. You know, I've heard it called the poor man's downrigger. And essentially what that is, it's a heavier weight, either a bottom bouncer or some other type of egg weight. And you have that tied off 
to about a two foot, maybe a four foot leader. And on that is a crankbait and that keeps it close, but you still get that action of the crankbait. And that's another one that you can use that you can slow pull up river. Sometimes you can move a little bit faster because of the heavier weight, but that is one that can be absolutely deadly on the river at times as well. Now I'll work a lot of these baits is I'll start moving slowly up river. You know, a lot of times 0.2 to 0.3 miles an hour, just slowly working up that current. That is the one that I try first. So what I'll do is I'll do a few different passes where I'll go up and then I'll drift back down and I'll go up and I'll drift back down. And more often than not, it's that slow drift up that triggers the more bite. But every once in a while, that slow drift back with the current is definitely the more effective method. Every once in a while, I will just anchor up and either pitch or let that bait just sit down there and slowly work in the current and let the fish swim up and past them. Um, but like I said, nine times out of 10, that slow move up the river tends to be the best bite. And just one last little piece of advice, if you are heading up to the Rainy River, please support local. Buy bait up there, buy gas up there, eat up there, stay up there, support the local businesses up there. This Rainy River time can be a very big part of their business for the year. Yes, the summer is also very big, but the river run is obviously one of the most popular things that draws people to the area. So please, as you are up there, support those local businesses. And finally, don't be a pig. I don't know how many times that I've seen trash or fish guts when you could keep fish. You know, I know it's not always easy to find trash cans or to find areas to put your garbage, but please plan for that. Bring some garbage breaks or talk to somebody in town, find a place to dump your garbage instead of just leaving it at the landings or on the roads. Well, we made it. That was a lot of information in a short amount of time. So I hope you found value in this video. If you did, I would love it if you would subscribe. It helps me out a lot and helps me to continue to put out content like this. Well, I'm gonna finish getting the boat ready because hopefully the river is gonna be opening up shortly and I can get up there as soon as possible. As always, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Thank you.